Thank you, Mr. President, for a very interesting intervention. I feel that what they are not going uh, more of a speech has been more of a discussion because what you're saying sounds offensive to the government of the Russian Federation and to others as well. You said that we are doing something. I've been standing here for, for an hour and explaining what we are doing. Now, did you fall asleep? Maybe you, you took a nap, a cat nap, as they say, and you didn't hear what I said. For an hour, I was speaking about a whole program of of 10 items on the agenda. Therefore, we're not just doing something, we're working on a new development strategy, and we have it in place. And we've done it for more, for more than a year, and not alone. We've done it together. Those brains that you've mentioned, entrepreneurial community with their associations, we constantly have meetings and conferences. We didn't do anything behind closed doors. Doors. And you suggest create certain structures, institutions, we have them in place, that central bank, the government of Russian Federation and part of the presidential administration in Russia. Now, as for the creation on the margins or within the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, a, a working group that could do something on the margins of the forum. It is well known, we know a famous saying, and we know who said it, if you want to fail something, you need to create a working group. But I have to admit, we have so many working groups right now. I don't know where where to chair them. There is yet another working group, and you need to be the head of it. I said, all right, I will think about it. And here, on the margins, yes, we can do that. But in the summer, please, because it's so cold, on the margins of St. Petersburg. But you are well known in our country, not only as an economist, but also as a political science uh, scientist, as a very outstanding person, and in certain dimensions of, of the thought, you are rather, rather robust in your ways of thinking, and it's always interesting to listen to such people, and I say it without um, any flattery. Besides, I have to uh, admit that sometimes I read what you write and what you say. Therefore, we're, we're not refusing to, to have this discussion. We're prepared to discuss everything that would benefit the Russian economy. Very well. Of course, I will agree with my president. But with one clarification, what kind of a model are we building? Do we know? I, I think that a perfect model for Russia would be an, an authoritarian socialist capitalism. So it is clear where are we going, because it seems that we're going the right way, and before that we followed the liberal path. I cannot really understand. Yes, we are doing something, and we are proud of what, what the government is doing. Finally, they've started to do it. Well, incidentally, when when uh, you know when the thunder stroke, you know, but before that, nothing happened. Well, you know, we'll overcome all circumstances. You know. Every difficulty. As for the model, I recently spoke during the meeting with the heads of news agencies from around the world. We need to look at what's happening around the world. For example, the Chinese model is believed by many experts to be more efficient than those models that existed before, including the North American or the European model. It is more e efficient. That is true. That is that is basically what you've just said. It has the combination 
of planned economy and a market economy. The Chinese managed to do that in their conditions, and I agree with this evaluation. It is indeed so. The figures of economic growth speak for themselves. But that works for the Chinese society and for the Chinese economy. I can agree with the following. When you gave a characteristic of my colleague, you mentioned that economy is, is a science, but to a certain extent, it's an art. Possibly so. Such models, when they're rigid, when it's one size fits all for all countries who are in different conditions, in different stages of its development, such rigid schemes do not work or work badly. And you always need to follow the reality of your country. And all things matter, the history, the culture, and the, the fabric of the society. Real development is crucial here to look at what works efficiently in our society. Naturally, there are basic things, and we always consider them. For example, talking about challenges, but Three, I think it was 3.6%. Uh, we haven't calculated it, uh, gave any final uh, evaluations, but as for 4.5% growth in first quarter of this year is also a good result of our joint work of the government, of the business community, and central bank and the presidential administration to boot. This is the result of our targeted action. And as for what is the foundation of our model, well, I have, I have just spoken. We are creating the backbone, and we are always making some decisions that have to do with the adjustment of our economic model. Uh, the whole of Siberia. I agree with you and that we need to develop the eastern parts of Russia, western Siberia, eastern Siberia, the Russian Far East. We started with the things were most urgent in terms of preserving our territories and developing them. We started with the Russian Far East because we were experiencing a fast depopulation and there was no way we could afford that to continue. And we can see that a lot has been done, done over the last decades, the last 10 years, to be more precise, in terms of developing the Russian Far East. I'm not going to dwell on that right now, but we've had an extensive program to that end. And the same applies to Siberia in general. Both Western Siberia and Eastern Siberia, Western Siberia has been developing extensively, uh, starting from the Soviet times, because, you know, it is the source of mineral resources the whole country utilizes. Is still gradually the uh, center of uh, economic development is moving eastwards and northwards. You know, you, you know who said that, that Russia is going to grow through Siberia. Right now we can say that Russia is going to be growing through the Arctic as well because the bulk of mineral resources is located over there in the north. Yes, it's expensive and difficult to develop those resources, but still it's a promising avenue to pursue, and this is precisely what we're doing. I have just spoken about the development of the Eastern uh, Polygon, the railroad. We started this work a long time ago, you know, when the Trans-Siberian mainland was constructed before the Russian-Japanese war, and then uh, you know, the Baikal Amur mainland during the Soviet times, and right now in the uh, new history of uh, in the, uh, Russia, we uh, set the goal for the development of this avenue. Yes, we uh, had some miscalculation. We didn't think it would be as much in demand. That's what the government had thought, uh, so it has prolonged the development of the Eastern Polygon, but still this development is uh, moving forth. It is happening. 
happening, not to the scale initially planned, but we will be doing that. It's just that under the current circumstances, we can't afford to do it in the way that it was done during the Soviet time or even during the reforms of Stalipin. All he had to do is to hand out land. Why? The major means of production back then was land. Right now, the major means of production is human brains. We need to develop technologies. We need to build universities and train and educate proper people for that. And that's what we're focused on as well. Um, during my speech, I mentioned student campuses in 40 universities that are to be created. We talked about development of science and education. I talked about the necessity of use of robotization, AI. Well, to a large degree, all of it will be happening in Siberia. This is our approach, and this is where we are going to move our biggest companies. Unfortunately, you can't do it purely through the administrative effort. I already mentioned uh, some companies that operate in Siberia anyway, specifically Rus Hydra. This is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, hydropower company in the world. And the manager of this company, when I appointed him, I told him there is one condition, you have to move over to Siberia. This is where the headquarters would be. And he agreed. Will the family go with you? He said it would. And clearly it's not just about uh, building a, a house. You have to hire people there. There. and this particular manager was ready to go to Siberia straight away. But hiring the right people there, it's no easy story. Some people are ready to relocate, some are not, some you can't afford to lose. This is a process, and this process has to evolve organically. But undoubtedly, this is the goal we have. I fully agree with you on that. And we have to pursue it very consistently, because the, the centers of the world development is there, and we have to be closer to those centers. Peter the Great was breaking the window, building the window to Europe, because the center of development was in Europe back then. Uh, the centers of the world development right now are shifting towards Asia. There is no doubt about it. And we have to be closer to those centers. You're right. I would like to have a quick follow-up question that I've been preparing for a long time. Well, Peter the Great is renowned for establishing close ties between Russia and Europe, opening up Russia to Europe. Back then, that was the most promising market. Why don't we create the third capital in Russia so that we stand on three pillars? Somewhere around one of the largest cities, this is where young, talented people would be ready to relocate that are truly energetic. Uh, this is where we would create new elite. Uh, based on your order, we could move some ministries there. And you've just said it yourself. Administrative resource alone can't do all of it, but still it can't do much. And many companies would be forced to relocate to follow high salaries if you decide so. Don't you want to repeat the uh, great deed of Peter the Great? He did it well. Well, Peter the Great is a truly historic figure. And he was the Tsar of Russia and then Russian Emperor. And the conditions there were entirely different. The state of the society was entirely different. Uh, the process of goal setting back then was entirely different. In today's world, we need to use those means that would be effective today. And no matter how close we are mentally to taking fast decisions and act through administrative resource, I still believe it is crucial to think carefully how successful can we be if we simply try to issue instructions and orders to the society. I believe we need to act differently. First and foremost, we need to get society interested in making progress. You need to get the society excited. And if we create the right conditions for development, then the centers of economic activity would be automatically shifting there on their own. Just to cite their example of the Far East. Many years ago, 
I visited uh, the ship uh, building enterprise there. It was close to Vladivostok. And uh, back then, it was in a dire condition. And this is when I said that here we are not just going to recover what we used to have, but we are going to establish new competences. We're now going to build new ships there. You should have seen people standing around me back then. Those were regular workers and engineers. They looked very skeptical. And I have to tell you, it took massive effort to build the cluster that is being created there right now. It's not just about money that would be constantly embezzled, and unfortunately I have to acknowledge that. We tried to approach this project several times, twice or even three times, and the current leader of Rosneft, Igor Sechin, has put his hands on that and created a large whole ship construction and shipbuilding enterprise there. And it took massive effort. It's not an easy thing. But what I'm trying to say is that we finally have the right talent there. Since the salaries are high, people are ready to move, and the level of salaries went up. The level of technological culture is not now much more advanced. There is a cooperation with the neighboring countries in the region, and right now, the uh, leadership of shipbuilding industry is all around VTB Bank and Mr. Kostin, who is seated here in the front row. I am really pleased to see that he is very much engaged into this business. It looks like as if he has never been in finance and he would dedicate all of his life to shipbuilding. Right now we're thinking where else we could create one more enterprise of a kind and we also see that it could be somewhere on the ocean coastline or close to the coastline. And through that kind of natural and I'm sorry, I'm really worried I may traumatize your imperial mindset, but we're trying to pursue that through the market ways and market approaches. <coughs> And this is a good promise for success. Of course, this work is complicated, but it would be really substantial. And when I mentioned Stolypin, yes, uh, back then it was all about strict orders and commands, and we all remember the tough measures that were imposed up to extreme and uh, death sentences. But back then it was uh, economically feasible and meaningful to act in this particular manner. You provide people with a major means of production, you provide them with land, you provide them with the right conditions and that it would work. Right now, giving orders and commands is not enough. I guess the approach that I'm suggesting is much more substantial and this is where we are very likely to succeed. But otherwise, you're right, of course we need to focus on this particular area. Well, this is no longer an imperialist idea. Well, I'm not sure that they would be ready to recognize this kind of system. Look, Bretton Woods system is long dead in 1976, and it was replaced by a Jamaica system, but at the same time, Bretton Woods system was largely based on the gold equivalent in 1976. Uh, or around this date, a number of other decisions were being made, and back then the United States decided to step away from the gold equivalent, and this is how a uh, Jamaica system was established. And this system decided to detach U.S. dollar from gold equivalent. And what is the foundation for this Jamaica system? Uh, this is still in force up until now. This one is based on trust towards U.S. economy. What is happening right now in reality? There is no other promise, no other collateral rather than trust towards U.S. economy. There is nothing else to support that in the world financial system. And right now the United States are exploiting and abusing their dominant position on the world financial market. And this exploitation is generating them a lot of money, according to the data that we have publicly available. The United States own the world economy about 54.3 trillion US dollars. 
This is the level of their debt. What is this number comprised of? Uh, this is 12.6 trillion US dollars. This is what uh, individuals hold on their bank accounts or literally in their pockets or under mattresses, as we say it in Russia, outside of the borders of the United States. Plus 10 more trillion is borrowed by the U.S. companies. So this is 22.6 trillion of U.S. dollars that are not backed by anything rather than trust towards U.S. economy and belief in the U.S. economy. And the remaining 54.3 uh, is what the residents of other countries decided to invest into U.S. companies. And that kind of investment in the U.S. company is backed by reliability and valuation of those companies. But of course, their security and reliability is strongly dependent on the US economy and US system as well. So what is happening in the world in this regard? The US economy is shrinking in size and the foundation, the major pillars of the economy are no longer that strong. There are cracks on them. I'm not only talking about the state debt that is massive, but they are not always coping with the goals they set themselves in terms of inflation targeting. They have targets on inflation of 2%, but as we've seen it lately during the pandemic, they go well above 7.8%, which is undermining trust towards the U.S. economy. Well, what is backing U.S. economy if it is still shrinking? Well, there is nothing to back it, and this is a problem. Undoubtedly, this is a problem for all holders of uh, U.S. dollars and uh, U.S. money base and assets. So, the fact that the U.S. economy is shrinking, its share in the global economy is being reduced, and it is entirely natural. And this is our shift towards multipolarity in the world economy and world finance. We could definitely come up with alternative systems, but uh, the importance, the role of a given currency is strongly dependent on the economy where it's circulating. So what we do right now is that together with our BRICS partners, we are designing this work together. And the role of Russia in this regard can be quite meaningful. We have established the new development bank. We have established our own currency tools. And a large part of the participants of economic activity are switching over to settlement in national currencies. Uh, take example of China, 90% of our trade is settled in uh, renminbi and Russian rubles. If you look at the territory of post-Soviet countries, the share of Russian ruble is also getting close to 70%. So our role in this regard is quite meaningful, but we have to do it together. That would make it all more substantial. What the U.S. financial authorities are doing right now, we've been discussing it yesterday with some of our colleagues until late yesterday. Uh, we've been discussing the composition of our today's session and the potential topics, and we came to conclude that the U.S. authorities, just like what was happening in the U.K., they've been intentionally breaking the equipment, the hardware they've been using themselves that kind of sabotage, and this is what exactly the U.S. authorities are doing themselves. They are destroying and breaking down the mechanism of ensuring their dominance and their supremacy. And U.S. dollar is a mechanism of U.S. supremacy today. And with their own hands, they are fostering the road to step away from the use of U.S. dollar. And that would be happening anyway due to the shrinking U.S. economy. But through those actions, they are only accelerating this process, and it's only logical that new payment mechanisms are emerging, let's say financial instruments of the central banks that we're talking about within the BRICS format. There are also some other thoughts on that. For example, right now, our colleague from Zimbabwe mentioned the importance of attracting investment. Yes, that can be done and should be done, and not just for Zimbabwe, but also for other African countries and countries 
Азии и вообще Азии, быстро развивающихся. Provide guarantees for this investment and their returns. What else can we use other than gold when it can be a guarantee through the quality of the investment projects? If we are to provide for high quality of the investment project, then we have to do that together. Quality and stability of political regimes. Well, this is that can allow us to establish settlement system that would be entirely protected from volatility and inflation. It can be done. And we've been discussing it with my friend and colleague, uh, President Xi, during my visit to China. We are going to discuss it. In the 90s, we simply did not spend away. We destroyed all of that capacity. I know that fully well. I remember it because I used to work here in St. Petersburg. 70% of the city's economy was made up by the military and defense industry. Almost all of it was destroyed to the ground. Naturally, from the beginning of 2000s, we had to start working on rebuilding that. A lot was done already on up-to-date up industrial basis. But we always believe that we would need to think about the conversion. Not simply about conversion, but we need to think about the development of these productions in a modern way. What do I mean by that? Because around the world, those who produce special equipment and munitions and military equipment, they also produce the civilian-oriented products, and that has tremendous synergy in not only raising investment, but also attracting high technologies. And we're quite successful. We have a plan. It is always in place and always being executed. For example, take last year. Defense industry produced about 25% of civilian production, about 25.1%, or maybe. 0.2%. That was in 2022, and last year uh, that civilian production stood at 29 something percent, almost 30. Therefore, this process is always taking place. We also must think about our military expenditure and that they are in line with the needs of today and the level of development of our economy because we cannot parasitize on anything, as it is, for example, being done in the United States. Their balance of payments deficit, their tra trade balance, is at about one trillion US dollars per year. Try to imagine that. Everyone here in the audience can really understand what that is. This is neo-colonialism in its modern issue. Using the monopoly of dollar, the United States are consuming by one trillion per year more than they produce, pumping out the resources from other countries. We were thinking back to the pandemic in the times of the pandemic. What was done back then? I don't remember how much, they, how much money they printed. I think about five and something trillion dollars. And Europe printed about 3.4 trillion euros. What was done next? They distributed this paper around their country. Later, they dis started to buy up food goods, like a vacuum cleaner. They cleaned out the whole world. And for the first time, for many years, they did not. They weren't. They were not exporters, but net importers of food. Right away, the food inflation skyrocketed around the world. But we cannot behave this way. We don't have this monopoly on on the world currency as the U.S. does, and we've never behaved ourselves as colonialists or neo-colonialists. 
here. We need to use the capacity of the economy and to have a realistic evaluation of it. That is precisely what we do. And we try to balance out the situation in the industry, in the real sector of the economy, and for the future. Naturally, we're thinking about diversification. That is how we work. Thank you. Wonderful. Yet another question about economy, because I know that this question is very important for a major part of the audience. I'm not as bothered by it, but still, I can feel the vibe. We're conducting partial nationalization. Some say that it is being done to amend those terrible mistakes or whatever that was during the round of privatization. Those reforms indeed were rather dumb. Now we have a, a matter of uh, private property and that was the reason for tremendous corruption because there was a matter of corruption and rob organized crime. Well, now we, we have a reverse correction of privatization, but where is the limit? Where is the limit for that deprivatization? Can we define them finally? Because if we say that we correct those mistakes that were done back in the 90s, then all mistakes were made because everything that we did was illegal. It was done illegal with violations. I had to deal with those economic processes because science did not give me any wages and I had to keep my family up. So I know what was happening back in the day. So everyone needs to be deprivatized right now. But that would undermine the foundation for our success. We saw the way private capital, including in our complex war conditions, is very flexibly finding and filling new niches and gives us a much more flexible economy if it was purely state-based. Should we stop somewhere? Maybe we can say that the mineral resources are being taken away by the state, we prohibit the outflow of capital and we declare private property sacred after a certain extent. And the KPI of governors and all uh, leadership would be based on the level of defense of private property. As for mineral resources, they're all, even right now, they're the property of the state. That is the way it works. Sometimes they're leased to be managed by the companies. Still, it's a property of the state. Second thing, you spoke about criminal or wrongful privatization of the 90s. You know, however hurtful it might be for many in the country, Still, I would not use such terms. I would not call it illegal or criminal. I don't think that it was done deliberately for criminal ends, but it was largely erroneous. It was based on the opinion of the economists with world-renowned names, also with Russian background. They said that everything needs to be privatized as soon as possible, even if it costs one dollar. Most importantly, that it lands in the hands of effective managers and the estate cannot be a successful manager. Life has proven to us that in our country, in the conditions before and now, that's not quite the correct approach, to put it mildly, to receive a top result, to have most efficiency. It turns out that the state can also be an effective owner, can show it in multiple situations, especially in major industries that require tremendous investments, because back in the day, no one had something to invest. Therefore, come the fraudsters with their schemes. And during this false privatization, which is basically pillaging of state property, money was borrowed from 
from the state banks. They took it for half a penny for the asset. After it fulfilled its goal, they returned the asset or returned the loan. So basically, that's pillaging. Now, maybe it was in economically incorrect, but still legal solutions that have to do with privatization, I would not um, revise that. The prosecutor's office deals only with matters that are criminal in terms of privatization of state-owned property. But you are quite correct in the sense that there should be some healthy limit lines. And we speak about that with the business community. And I'm a proponent, proponent of making a decision not at the level of a presidential decree or a governmental decree, but as a law. Right now, we are thinking about that with the business community. And I'm sure that we will find a solution. Yes, it is so, as uh, Yosef Stalin said, but I don't have anything else, anybody else for you. Uh, when he spoke about the writers in the USSR, when yet another time Beria came over and said that he's dissatisfied with Soviet writers, and he, well, Stalin said, I have no substitutes for you. And we'll need to achieve such agreements and such conditions that would be A, in line with our interests, and B, um, be reliable. You're quite right that it's very hard to agree with uh, such people. They're always deceiving you. They say one thing and do another thing. That is quite sad. But all armed conflicts and with certain peace agreements. One of the leaders of a, a major European countries said that such agreements can be based on a military defeat or a victory. Naturally, we will achieve a victory, that is clear. The matter of legitimacy of the status of those who we have to agree with. Yes, indeed, there are some issues because it seems that the incumbent authorities, if, we, if you take a, a quick look at the legislation of the Ukraine, it seems that the executive authorities of the Ukraine have lost their legitimacy. Article 103 of the Ukrainian constitution states that the election is done for only five years, and Article 83 of the Ukrainian constitution says that during the martial law, the mandate of the Verkhovna Rada, the parliament, may be extended, may be extended, of the Verkhovna Rada. And nothing is said about the extension of the mandate of the president. Now, there is also a law about the martial law and the way it works. It is said that during the martial law, the elections of the presidential elections are not being held, but it is not said that they are extended. I've graduated from St. Petersburg University as a legal professional, and that is very important. It is not mentioned in the law, it does not exist. The penal code has the relevant article about the usurpation of the power, and it seems that it is indeed the case. Still, you can negotiate, because I think that according with the article 110 or 110 or 11 or 9, the mandate is transferred to the Speaker of the Kovna Rada, the Parliament. Therefore, if uh, there is a will, uh, we can find someone to negotiate with. But I can repeat that only on those conditions that we have agreed on when we started those negotiations in Minsk and later in Istanbul, and not just some notions. So if we take as a basis those Istanbul agreements, we still need to proceed from the reality of today. That's the just 
major brush strokes. As far as nuclear escalation is concerned, we never were the ones to start this rhetoric. I do not remember who was that lady, for, it was the former UK Prime Minister, when uh, she became the Prime Minister, uh, she, 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 said she said she was willing to uh, push the nuclear button. We never said we were. We only said that we have to treat this matter very seriously, and we did that. Everyone was accusing us of uh, saber-rattling. Uh, uh, using the nuclear weaponry. We, we're not doing that. Now, as far as uh, the use or non-use of nuclear weapons is concerned, we've got the nuclear doctrine which says it all. Just uh, the day before yesterday, I spoke to the heads of uh, news agencies and I explained this to them. I said, we've got the nuclear doctrine which says that we can only use the nuclear weapons in uh, Emergency cases when uh, our sovereignty and territorial integrity are threatened, I do not think we're there. I see no need for that. But the nuclear doctrine is a living document, and we are carefully following what is currently happening across the world and around us, and we do not rule out the possibility of uh, making amendments to the doctrine. Now, moving on to the nuclear tests. In the past, we signed the treaty and ratified it, whereas the U.S. did sign the treaty but didn't ratify, so that's why we withdrew the ratification. If need be, we can conduct the nuclear tests, but so far there is no need for that because we've got the computers and the information systems that allow us to do that uh, virtually. Now, you spoke about the speed, the outcomes. You said that incumbent upon me is great responsibility. That's true. Can we speed up the decision-making processes? Yes, we can. But it will accordingly bring up the possible losses, and that's why I take into account what the proposals uh, from the general staff are saying. Speed is important, but the most important thing is to care for the lives and for the safety of our guys who are fighting at the front lines. That is why the military are doing their work starting from uh, this uh, beginning of this year. 47 settlements have been liberated, around 880 square kilometers. We are pushing the adversary from the territory of Donbass and the adjacent territories. The general staff and the Ministry of Defense have the requisite plans for us to achieve all our plans, all the goals we have set forth, and I'm confident that all of these plans will be implemented. Well, You'll bring out the heat. I think everyone has got scared already. Well, you've spoken about the Europeans. There can be different types of logic. But God forbid it should come to some kind of strike. Everyone needs to understand that we have uh, the early warning system for missile attacks. The same system is something the U.S. has. No one else has such a well-developed system. Europe has no such early warning system. So in that sense, they are more or less defenseless. Second, the power, the might of the strikes. Our tactical nukes are three or four times more powerful than the bombs the Americans used against Hiroshima and Nagasaki, three or four times. And as far as their number goes, we've got dozens of times more of those on the European continent, even if the Americans were to bring theirs over to Europe from the U.S. We still have more. So, God forbid it happens. I do hope it never happens. A sign of the cross for that, but you, you say 
it'll help save lives. But you know, it might on the contrary lead to numerous numberless losses. And, you know, if the uh, Americans were to get involved in that exchange of strikes using their strategic weapons, well, I, I don't think they would get involved. And the Europeans have to think about that as well. But be that as it may, I am hopeful that it will never come to that point. And there is no need on our part for that to happen, because our military are gaining experience, raising their efficiency, our defense industry is performing admirably. I've spoken about that extensively. We have raised the production of munitions 20 times, which is many times as much as our adversary uh, is capable of in terms of uh, aircraft, in terms of uh, armored vehicles and so on and so forth. We are superior, so there is no need for us even to contemplate such a possibility. So please, I would like to address everyone. Do not mention such things idly. My decisions and the decisions of my colleagues I'm working with on these matters do not involve any hesitation. There is no room for hesitation, and there is none in reality. All of our decisions are based upon the objective and biased analysis of the current developments, and this is how we are moving forward. Or at least we shouldn't be saying that out loud. As far as aircraft carriers are concerned, you said they're useless. No, they're not. They are useless in a global conflict from the strategic point of view. But as far as geopolitical tasks are concerned, as a tool of geopolitics, you know, to move them closer to territories where Americans or the French or the British want to fight or to force someone to do something, yes, uh, carriers can be useful, especially, but of course, uh, given the fact that China and Russia have at their disposal uh, precision guided hypersonic weapons, yes, the sense of aircraft carriers is uh, disappearing, you say uh, they shouldn't spend money on that, but let them, let them spend money on aircraft carriers. Well, I'm addressing our friends in India and China. They are also spending money. Well, I said there might be some geopolitical uh, rationale involved. Of course, they are no longer useful as a strategic weapons, but they still have other uses. And as far as other countries are concerned, let them spend spend money on those aircraft carriers. Now, on to weapon supplies. We're not doing that yet, but reserve, we do reserve the right to do that, to provide weapons to uh, countries or legal structures who are experiencing certain pressure, including military pressure, from the countries that are providing weapons to Ukraine uh, are calling for these weapons to be used against Russia and against the Russian territory. If they provide such weapons to uh, the battlefield and if they call for these weapons to be used against us, why don't we have the right to uh, mirror that to act in kind and do the same. But I would go as far as to say that we are going to do that tomorrow, because any such supplies would involve a number of factors. 
that and this or that way would have a bearing on certain regions of the world and we have to give it a lot of thought. Well, if we were to follow the recommendations coming from you, if we were to follow as fast as possible, uh, if we were to go forward as fast as possible, then the current uh, level of troops wouldn't be enough, but we are following in different rationale. We are pushing the adversary out of the regions that have to come under our control. And that means there is no need for us to have any mobilization, and we have no plans for that. The mobilization cycle we had when we caught up to 300,000 people, it happened. But last year, without any mobilization, on a voluntary basis, our men Two patriots of the country volunteered to the draft centers, and the number of those uh, people stood at more than 300,000 people, those who volunteered last year. This year, starting from the beginning of the year, the draft centers have seen an influx of more than 160,000 people. On a daily basis, there's another thousand volunteers coming to the draft centers and signing the contracts. We see what the Russian character is, what's the character, the spirit of a Russian citizen involves, when we fully understand that, when we see it, then we see that we do not need, have any need for nuclear weapons to achieve final victory. And I can add that we are currently witnessing the force, full mobilization in Ukraine. I am confident that they're going to bring down the draft age, down. We have uh, accurate data from the Ukrainian sources that the Americans are uh, conditioning their support on this uh, lowering of draft age to 23 years, to 21, maybe to 18 years, maybe in one go to 18 years, maybe gradually. Then the leadership of Ukraine is going to be replaced. This is something I spoke about before, but what's important, they're only drafting uh, 30 or 50,000 uh, people. Last month it was around 70,000 people, and there's going to be a lowering of that number. And it means everything they're drafting, everyone they're drafting is only going to be enough to replenish their losses. There's going to be a slight increase. You can uh, have different types of calculations. I'm not going to cite the figures, even though we have those. But you know, it's different in Russia. We've got volunteers who come of their own accord, of their own volition to draft centers, and there is no need for mobilization. Well, we're not writing off any ideas or any arguments. We do take them all into account. Thank you for your recommendations. And now I'd like to move over to the question. Uh, we are getting back to the agenda of the world economy, and this is the matter that you addressed earlier. So, both you and I have experienced communist ideology. So, this is probably not where we're willing to get back to. But nonetheless, a true great state cannot do without national ideology or a grand idea. And uh, those states, those countries that were losing this national idea or national ideology would be inevitably falling apart. And the world could be considered a graveyard full of shadows of that kind of countries. And by the way, our country experienced it twice. First, we lost our belief in the Russian Tsar and our motherland, and second time when we lost our faith in communism. And now we are trying to oppose to introduction of a rigid state ideology. Clearly, uh, the ideology could be shaped and phrased easily. You've done it yourself, partially in your speeches. Uh, 
Maybe that kind of ideology does not have to be mandatory, but maybe it has to be mandatory, at least for those people who want to be leaders of this country, who want to be elite of this country. Uh, this is a code of honor, and this code of honor could be written easily because we know it. And by the way, we are working on it. It is very close to the uh, Confucius idea of an honorable man, and we've been discussing it with religious leaders, uh, both from Orthodox Church and uh, Muslim leaders. They all agree that this kind of code of honor could be created and written down. Not for everyone. If people want to lead ordinary lives, let them live. That's all right. But if you want to lead, if you want to succeed in the society, then you absolutely need to stick to clear rules, and those rules have to be made clear. I'm not going to, to name them just in order not to waste time. Uh, those are pretty obvious. But I'm still wondering why we are hiding away. There is no need to make amendments to the Constitution. Why not introduce a single state ideology that is mandatory for everyone who is willing and ready to serve the country and society? Well, we are not afraid of anything. We are not uh, shying away. We, we, we are not afraid of anything. It's just that there is constitution that you mentioned yourself, and the constitution stated that there uh, should be no ideology. We used to have a state ideology. You mentioned yourself at the time of the Soviet Union, but availability of that kind of dominating ideology didn't stop the Soviet Union from collapsing. So, the idea that would unite a multinational country should be there, is needed. But you said it yourself that at first we lost our faith in uh, the Tsar and our motherland, but later in communism. Well, we've lost our faith in the Russian Tsar, but we definitely haven't lost our faith in this country, in our motherland. It's just that those types of beliefs were different, and those were different assessments of what is good or what is bad for our motherland. And this is a different question. In this regard, we need ideas. As for our faith in communism, it was lost, but not by everyone. Otherwise, we would not be having the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. And it has a lot of supporters. That's a fact. And I believe we need to treat it with respect. But you're right in saying that we need ideas that would unite us. And that kind of uniting idea and the events of today are showing it, could be the true patriotism, the true genuine patriotism. And those people who voluntarily go to the front line are ready to suffer their lives, their health, is the best confirmation of this fact. This is the actual true patriotism. But you have to approach it in a very reasonable manner. You need to present it properly, reasonably, in a really beautiful manner. Please help us with that. That would be my pleasure. And I agree it has to be done. And I'd like to assure you that I remember the time when the communist ideology was dying out. I wasn't sorry about it. But because of the death of the communist ideology, uh, that country back then died, and uh, that is because vacuum uh, emerged, and there must be no vacuum. We need to fill it with clear things. Give us an order, and we will act on it. But then we need to present it to the society, to the elite, to make it more or less mandatory. And then it would work. By the way, the way the communist ideology worked, that was mandatory for everyone. And for a very long time, for many years, there were many beautiful things about it, and it was helping our country to move forward. It helped us win in a horrendous, dramatic war. So we do need ideology. You know what? I suggest we do not go any deep into this discussion. We do not make it any more extreme. I'm happy to discuss it with you, but it's not just this communist ideology, although it played an important role in our victory in the Second World War. But if that would be the only thing uniting this multinational country, well, 
Yeah, it could be. But then my question is, why would that be the case that people would be uh, carrying uh, icons on aircrafts above Moscow to give it protection? Why church was brought back uh, to this country? Well, just as like we hear it today, out there in the battlefield, there are no soldiers who do not believe in God. And the same happened back then. Uh, of course, ideology played a role. People were going to the front line for their motherland, for Stalin. But motherland would always come first. Uh, we must not forget about it. Well, I have nothing to object to that. You're right. Although, as for the possibility of exciting people from Afghanistan coming to our country, well, we have to think about it. Right now, there is a number of exciting personalities coming from other countries to Russia. But you're right. You're right, that kind of uh, reasonable, well thought through policy is not yet available. We used to have uh, one uh, agency for that, but it was later merged with the Ministry of Internal Affairs due to security reservations we've had. Whether this is a problem or not is a question. We are discussing it with our colleagues, and I said a goal to the Russian government and the Security Council. It is important to revisit this matter and as soon as possible. We cannot pretend that the problem does not exist. It is there. Uh, this is the uh, importance of engaging uh, labor workers, migrant workers, with a virtually zero unemployment rate right now, and shortage of workers is an important limiting factor to the economic growth. And you're right in saying that it's not just that we need uh, uh, labor migrants, but we need people of a certain qualification and training uh, with proper command of Russian language and understanding of Russian culture. And my colleagues who very well understand it, our colleagues from the countries where most of migrant workers are coming to Russia. And together we are discussing what is the best way to facilitate this work and how to train and educate those migrant workers in terms of the command of Russian language and being aware of the Russian legislation so that the migrant workers are feeling comfortable and most importantly local population is not experiencing any difficulties be that in the labor market or in their daily lives because where most migrant workers are settling is whenever there is economic life is happening this is Moscow Moscow region here in St. Petersburg in some uh, cities of Siberia where the salaries are higher we definitely need to do a lot in this area I fully agree with you <clears throat> now, as for the possible loss of certain elements of European culture or, or genes, as, as, as you mentioned, the genes of European culture due to the fact that we are turning towards East and Asia. First of all, we are not turning around due to for some short-term notions of today. This turn is happening around the world in general due to the rise of new centers of economic development. We have started this work long before the tragic events of today in Ukraine. I have said it at the very beginning. The economy is shrinking and the impact on the global economy is shrinking of the previously um, standing economic centers. The overall GDP of BRICS countries is higher than accumulated GDP of the so-called G7. And these trends are not only present, but they're speeding up. They're accelerating. I mean the economic growth for today and for the nearest future. This is unavoidable, unavoidable phenomena, and nothing can be done about it. No one can do anything about it. Whatever happens, this trend will continue. And just like before, we, as we have discussed it, Peter I opened a window into Europe because this was the, the promise of the future, markets, technologies, 
he, he um, put some boots um, as it what used as it was done in the Netherlands before. It was an example, but the world is becoming more diverse, and we try to respond to that. As for the elements of European culture, we are not losing them, the elements and the European genes and the culture, but that part of Europe that is called the Western Europe, where is that European culture? It will soon be gone. It will be just architectural monuments, but the culture, first and foremost, is the consciousness of people. Today it is being poisoned by global liberalists. They are prioritizing not the interests of their own nations and their cultural code, national code, and some notions far removed from reality, something about global liberalism. liberalism. I think that this is key. By definition, to a certain extent, we are becoming a center of traditional European culture and traditional European values. And if we think back and look into the history, even to those who, who are non-believers, is first and foremost based on the, on the Christian culture. For us, for Russia, with many religions, and I don't know who was the author of the words, you said that first and foremost this is the military machine for, for, for the Russian nation. Whoever said it, I don't agree with that, because initially Russia was coming together as a nation with multiple religions. Think back to the orders of Catherine the Great or other other leaders, as they would have called them, czars and emperors, when they acquired new territories, they always told to respect the local population, their traditions and their beliefs. That's how Russia came together. Naturally, a major part of Russian culture is European culture. And we become the carriers of that culture while it is being killed off in the European states. Today, being aware of that, many Europeans try to develop using their own traditional values, whether they succeed or not. We will see as the results of the election to the European Parliament, the EU Parliament. What, what needs to be done? is to develop our country using those historical traditions of the past that brought it together as a multinational, multi-confessional state. You spoke about the role of St. Petersburg. It is indeed what we are doing right now. All our cultural activities are being developed in many dimensions, including with our friends and partners from around the world, from all continents, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and so on. You mentioned St. Petersburg, and I'm looking at the picture to the left, to the right. Look, in the center of this picture, well, to, to my right, is St. Isaac's Cathedral, even more to the right, Senate and Synod, the Admiralty. This is the view from the university where I used to study, from the 12 colleges building, the first government of Russia. To the right, the Menshikov Palace. And over here, this is the spit of um, St. Basil, of Basil's Island, rostral columns, St. Isaac's Cathedral, the stock market. This is the view from the Hermitage. But if we cross over and look back to the 12 colleges building or the Hermitage, it will be just as beautiful. Why? Why? Because all of it was built on the most important principle and the law, which is called harmony. And we will build our policy on this, on harmony. And Russia, of course, will be a part of this multipolar, harmonious world. 
It is quite natural for us that it will be following to a major extent the European culture because the Russian nation is part of that but will treat with the same respect culture and traditions of other nations of the Russian Federation and we are powerful through this unity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, friends. This was a very interesting intellectual and political event. And I hope that it was interesting for our audience. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to thank our guests and our moderator. Thank you.